Titan Medical Center, we provide first class patient care. And we also do bioidentical hormone replacement therapy for males and females. We also offer medical weight loss, vitamin and amino acid injectable therapies, and rejuvenation detox. Along with those libido enhancers, you know you want to pleasure your partner, right? So if you want to feel better, look better, and perform better, call us at 727-389-3220 to become part of the Titan Medical family. RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition, Cuts Training and Fitness, and Liquid Sunrays. I'm your host, Sadiq Faruqi. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IFBB pros, competitions. Of course, we had the New York Pro this past weekend, and yesterday, we actually had Keon Pierce in the 2019 Classic Physique Champion of the New York Pro. That interview now live at RxMuscle.com and the YouTube channel. And then Dave, yesterday, we had an episode of Iron Debate where we debated the 212 division, a conversation sparked by a, quote, controversial decision putting uh, Ahmad Ashkenani over Eduardo Correa at the New York Pro 212 division. It sparked a conversation, a very early conversation, about 212 Olympia title favorites uh, for the upcoming Olympia title vacated by Flex Lewis. Yeah, you know, Sid, uh, it, it, it seems like this whole year has been about Brazil lately. Have you noticed that? Brazil's been in the news. Yes. We had Rafa Brandeo yes. uh, really kind of really capturing the attention of the bodybuilding community in the open division for the first half of the year. Now we're into like the next, the next quarter, and now it's like uh, the return of Eduardo Correa. Uh, obviously, he has finished as high as second at the 212 Olympia. And, you know, Ashkenani getting that very controversial decision over him. But, you know, then we debated, you know, who, who might win the 212 Olympia now that Flex Lewis is gone. So that, that's a really cool question because, you know, people don't know. You know, Ashkenani, highest rated guy maybe. But then you have, you know, um, you know, you got, what's his name? Der um, Derek Lunsford. Derek Lunsford, excuse me, thank you. Derek Lunsford, who's, you know, was second at the Olympia last year. And, you know, he's the guy, that, the young guy on the block that everyone wants to take over. But then you got guys, older guys, a 48-year-old guy, you know, um, uh, Kamal Algarni, who won the Arnold two years ago. And, and you, you can't count him out. So it's like, you know, who might win the Olympia? So it's exciting in that division because there's a vacated title. So I think the debate was great. You know, obviously Guy Cicernino, Dennis James, very opinionated. Chris, very vocal about his, you know, uh, I guess his disagreement with the decision at the New York Pro. And I, and I thought it came off as a great show. On another note, however, um, I got my Heavy Muscle Radio t-shirt I was t -shirt just going to ask you about that. Look, swear to God, this is not like a plant question. I just noticed you as you were talking, and I, I, I'm like, where'd you get that shirt from? I just got it in the mail. You know, now we, on our YouTube channel, we use Teespring now. So we, I upload all our logos there, and I create clothing with it. And they're, they're print on demand, so you guys can buy them from our little YouTube store. And then they get sent to you. you know, like it usually takes about a week or two before they build up enough, and then they send out all the t-shirts. And I got a mug with, with this logo on it. I got my t-shirt. I got an RX Muscle t-shirt. And I just actually uploaded a new design for Iron Rage. It's a nice blue, very blue shirt. And it says Iron Rage on it. So if you guys, you know, if you like the little logos and you like our, you know, what we do here at RX Muscle and you want to represent, now I don't have to stock a thousand shirts of everything in, in, in a warehouse that I don't have. I can just send you guys right to the link and you can buy it there yourself. So great stuff. Uh, I love Teespring. I think it's a, an amazing idea. Let's get to the questions. The first two questions from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. First question, Dave, I know you speak of your off-season diet very often when you were a mass monster, but what was your contest prep diet like? Did you eat six meals a day like you preach for men? Did you yourself use keto? How much cardio, if any? You know, back in the, toward the end of my career, I did very little cardio, uh, maybe like 20 minutes, you know, a day. Early in my career, I was doing, a, you know, sometimes an hour and a half to two hours just because I wanted to be crazy shredded and, and I probably ate more food and then did more cardio. And I realized that, you know, moving forward that less was better. As I got older, I, I figured, well, you know, if I could, I'll just eat a little less and I'll do less cardio. So earlier in my career, I was eating like seven times a day. But I always found that if I, if I didn't reduce my meals to six feedings a day, I had trouble getting that last bit of grainy hardness. It's like... It's like, and I always equate it to the way people today drink all the aminos all day long, and they wonder why they don't get that crisp, dry look. 
you got to suffer that last 1% to 2% of body fat off. You have to be crazy feeling like you want to die all day long for the last, I'd say anywhere from two to four weeks when your body fat gets really low. It just, it's just part of the equation. And the problem is a lot of people don't want to go into that death zone, I call it. They don't want to feel like that. They want to feel, they, I need more food. I need more food. They say, I need more food. And they wind up eating too much and they never get to that super crisp conditioning that just wows the judges. So, you know, it, it goes back to how many meals did I eat? I ate at the, at the end of my diet, I was eating six times a day. And, and I found that low carb worked well for me. But having said that, what I would do is I would go like two, three days low, low carb, like keto essentially, um, high fats, high protein. And then when I would get super flat, rather, you know, rather than you know, carb up the whole day with rice, I would go and have McDonald's. I would have like you know, cheeseburgers and fries you know, for one meal. And I would fill myself up. And, and, and toward the end of my career, I was doing protein and fat five meals a day, and, and one of the meals was, was, was McDonald's. So I was eating carbs one time a day. So I really wasn't, I guess, theoretically in a, in a ketogenic diet. But the, if you think about it, McDonald's doesn't really, I mean, a, a small fries for a guy who's 280, you know, is really not a lot of carbs. I think I was still in ketosis because I felt like I was in ketosis because um, I was burning off all those carbs. I just don't think I was taking myself out of ketosis with one McDonald's meal a day. And that's how I dieted at the end. But in the beginning, I was very regimented, and I started out a lot of uh, on my contest diet with doing no fat. I always did the you know the protein, high protein, moderate carbs, to low carbs, no fat, and I found I didn't look good with that. And then little by little, I started adding more and more fats, and I lowered the carbs lower and lower. And what I would do is literally I would cheat myself. I would you know I would say all right, I'm going to have a cup of rice, and then I would start when I would cook it in the morning. I'd be like ah, I only need a half a cup, and before I know it, I was getting two tables two tablespoons of rice. And I was adding a little more protein and I was adding a couple more you know, nuts or a little more avocado or a little more oil. And I found that I, I looked better and felt better on the lower carbs and the higher fats. And, and so that just, that's how I kind of developed my ketogenic diet. I started realizing that the carbs weren't quite as important as people thought. And when you lowered them to a certain point, all of a sudden you, your brain got clear and you felt better. And, and I didn't know that was ketosis at first. Because no one knew about that stuff. And I had to do a lot of research and, and, and in books because there was no internet back then. And I figured it out. And I said, you know what? If you feel better, it's going to make the diet that much easier. And I just had to watch my metabolism because it was very fast. So I had to feed myself when I would get too flat. And that's why it's good to have a coach. I have guys that are on a ketogenic diet, but I'm feeding them McDonald's every couple days because, because their bodies are going too flat and they just need it. So... That's where a coach comes in. It's hard to tell yourself when to cheat and when not to cheat. But if you have someone else doing it for you, it makes it a lot easier. Second question again from the Dave Palumbo Experience app. Dave, why don't you think nutrient timing is important? It would make sense if you're ingesting more calories around time that you're actually burning more calories. I see in your diet you often eliminate carbs in the last meal before bed yourself. Yeah. Here, look, let's look at it from this perspective. Okay. Carbohydrates in your body is like gasoline in your car. Okay, you need the carbs to, to, to fuel your whatever you're doing, right? So there's a tank, okay, in your body. It's called the glycogen storage in the muscles and in the liver. Okay, when the tank is filled, okay, no matter how you fill it, you can fill it in the morning, you know, eating all your carbs, or you can fill it at night, all your carbs. You can spread it out throughout the day. The only difference between the, a human and a car is that in humans, when you when you take small meals throughout the day, you keep your blood sugar levels stable. When you eat carbs in maybe one, two, or three you know, feedings throughout the day in larger amounts, and then you're not eating other times of the day, you're getting drops in blood sugar, so you feel crappy. So if you're going to eat 200 grams of carbs for the day, what's the difference? Why, why would you only have it in two meals when you could have it in six meals spread evenly? You're still filling the, the, the glycogen stores the exact same way, but you're keeping blood sugar stable. That's why I like it. it they, Eating it around when you train is, is, is meaningless because when you're training, the carbs that you're using, okay, are the carbs that, number one, are in glycogen storage from what you ate the day before. So it has nothing, no bearing on what you're eating right now, okay? Most of the energy that your body m mobilizes, most of the carbs that your body mobilizes for glucose and for fuel comes from the storage that's in the muscle cells. So... You're, you, you think you're eating like at key times, but really you're not, okay? It doesn't matter. Spread your meals evenly. It doesn't matter. The only time, the only reason I don't like to eat carbs before bed 
is because it blunts your GH response. Okay, when you when you're before you go to bed, your body will release GH at 90 minutes into your sleep, but it will release more growth hormone in a lower carb environment naturally. Now we're not talking about taking a shot. If you take a shot, it doesn't matter what the blood sugar levels are in your blood because you're taking the actual GH. But if you want your body to naturally release maximal GH at night, eat protein and fat before bed and eat lower carbs. That's the only reason I do that. It has nothing to do with fat storage. It has nothing to do with anything else. Let's go to our Instagram questions. If you're not following us, our handle is official underscore RX muscles. Go to Kara84. Dave, how to get deep cuts, separation, and details in your quad? Is it solely related to conditioning or is there more to it? Since this has been a topic of conversation from the New York Pro, it would be nice if you could do, well, I mean, he goes on to say if you could do Iron Debate, but if you can give a primer as far as those deep cuts and separation, that was such a theme from this past New York Pro. Mm. That's diet related, okay? The less body fat you have, the more you're gonna see the, mess, the definition in the muscles. Now, the more muscle maturity you have, the longer you've been training, the more deep grooves and separation you actually have in your muscles. Now, why is that? Well, because when you build muscle, muscle initially you know, grows this way. Then when it can't grow this way anymore, it starts to create a three-dimensional effect. So the muscles get long first. When they can't go any longer, they start developing grooves, and that's what we call muscle maturity. I didn't understand that because when I first started, the first five years of my career, I put 100 pounds of muscle on. I had a ton of muscle, but I didn't have the, the, uh, the detail in my muscle, and I never understood that. The judges always said you need more um, detail in your muscles, and I'm thinking, I'm the leanest guy on stage. What the hell are they talking about? But 10 years later, you know, in, in you know, 2002 and three, where I was at the end of my career, you know, I might not have had, you know, I had injuries at that point in terms of my joints and stuff like that, but when I would hit flex my muscles out when I was in shape, I had crazy striations and, and separation and everything like that, and that's because I had been training another 10 years. And I wasn't getting any bigger, I was getting more grooves and detail to the muscle, and that's, that just comes with, that's why you look at a guy like Kamal el at 48 years old, or Dexter Jackson, you're like, how do I get that separation? Well, yeah, train for 25, 30 years and, and you'll have it. Um, so that, that you can't get overnight. And that's why we see, and sometimes we see guys that are fresh, like when Rami first came out, he was in his 20s. He, had no, he didn't have a lot of separation. He had a ton of muscle, but like where were the grooves? Okay, you could even be super lean and you may not have that. Now, having said that, I've seen Kai Green at 19 years old lock his leg out on stage and I saw striations in the muscles I had never seen in a human being before. That's genetics. So there is a certain genetic component to it, but you can get more separation in your muscles the longer you train. Let's go to Excellent 187. Dave, if glycogen stored in your body as a result of the carbs consumed the day or two prior, why do coaches recommend eating higher carbs on lagging body parts or big muscle groups if you'll only gain the benefits of loaded glycogen stores the day after? Be, be, <laughs> because people think they're going to grow from eating the carbs that day. And the reason they think that is because the next day they feel bigger, right? Because if you load on carbs the day that you're, that you're actually training a, a weak body part, the next day the body part might look a little bigger because it's going to be loaded with glycogen. It's, a, it's, a, it's an illusion. It's a false illusion. And, and once again, it's one of these what I call bro science People trying to make people think I have the secret. Look, do what I'm telling you. Load, load. He's right. Look, I feel bigger the next day. It's an illusion. Look, if you, if you have 300 pounds of muscle and you don't eat carbs for three days, you're going to feel flat, right? Okay? If you, eat, if you carb up for three days, you're going to feel huge and full. Okay? You're going to burn fat better in a depleted state, obviously. So I always say you go through that stage, what I call the flat and fat stage, where you, you're not really lean initially when you first start dieting but you're flat and you look worse. And you have to go through that, that intermediate stage before you get to that full stage. So whether your glycogen stores are crazy full or they're, a little de or they're de very depleted, it has nothing to do with, with building or you know, muscle. You know? It's just a fuel source. Worry about eating enough protein and enough essential fats on the days where you're training weak body parts. Don't worry about glycogen storage, okay? Now granted, if you glycogen load the day before you do a weak body part, you'll probably have a better workout because you'll feel that muscle a little bit more because there's more glycogen in the muscle. It's, it's stretching the skin a little more. It has a better pump. So if anything, you want to eat more food maybe the day before a weak body part, not the day of. Interesting here from um, Philip Rowe. I actually just looked this up right now. Uh, Dave, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but there are workout videos of you 
<laughs> uh, on YouTube. It's a channel called, and I'm not joking when I say this, My Sugar Daddy is Controlling Me. <laughs> That's the channel name. But I'm looking at it right now. There are five videos of you. I haven't opened any of them up yet, but uh -huh. uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but I guess we could check it out and Maybe see. Maybe uh, Yeah, interesting. Um, let's go to Adrian Lessie. During peak, do you ever leave water in any of your athletes without drastically cutting before a show? You mean like have them drink up to the day to show? Is that what he's saying? Yeah. You know, everyone's different. Sometimes people really get overly dehydrated, and I'll give them a little water even the day of a show. Especially when guys have, have sh or girls have shows that are later in the day. Like sometimes they have these Friday night prejudgings. And, you know, rather than cut their water the night before, I might get, I usually give them a little bit of water sometimes that day of the show because I see them getting a little too flat. Um, it, it really depends on the person, the show. I'm not against that, but most of the time I try to keep fluid, fluid intake pretty low. If anything, I'll give them carb sources that have water in it already. Like, you know, rather than eating rice cakes all day, you know, of a show, especially when you're competing later in the day, I'll have them use regular rice or potatoes, things that have moisture in them already so that their, their bodies are not going to go super dehydrated. Sometimes people go too, too dry and they just flatten out. So you do need some water in the muscles. Once again, it, it, that's why it's good to have a coach you can send pictures to and if you look too flat, they'll feed you or give you a little bit of fluid. Uh, you know, drinking two, three ounces, you know, if you're really overly dehydrated is not going to make you hold water. That water is going to go right into the muscle. But you have to time it right, you have to eat it with the right foods. And you have to, you know, you can't just sit there and guzzle, you know, 16 ounces down. That's not gonna, that's not gonna bode well for you. Let's go to Sid Medley. Speaking of coaching, Sid McGinnis, quick hitter here. Um, have you ever considered making your diet guru course into a book available on your website? You know, someone, I, I, maybe he asked me that. Maybe he emailed me directly. Yeah. The problem is, I, you know, the course is, is me teaching it. It's me sitting there interacting with people back and forth and explaining things the way I do in simplistic form and giving analogies. I don't think it would take me forever to write a book like that, explaining all that. And I don't think people would get the same out of it without having that one-on-one -on -one interaction with me. That's why I, I make it, you know, so that people have to come see me. I don't sell the book. Um, I don't you know, put it online. I want people to come and make the journey. Part of learning and part of, you know, bettering yourself and, and getting knowledge is actually leaving your comfort zone, okay? Getting on that airplane, flying to Cape Coral or wherever I'm holding the course, seeing me in person, that, that little pilgrimage, so to speak, can change the rest of your life, really, because it, it will infuse you with knowledge and confidence in yourself. You'll meet other people that are like-minded, like you. You'll be able to interact with me one-on-one, -on -one, and it's going to have a lasting impression on how you will be as a coach. I have people who've taken the course three times because they've gotten so much out of it from an energetic standpoint, not just knowledge standpoint, and they pick up new things every time they come, that they just see it as, as an uh, important part of their educational process, especially if they're going to do, be a coach as a career for the rest of their life. Because you can make well over six figures you know, as, as a coach nowadays, but you better know what you're doing because people will find out that you're a fraud if you don't. And that's why the, 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 the course is so good. And that's why people come and take the course. And that's why I fill up the class every single time. And I got news for you. The people who take the class have all gone on to become great coaches and are making a good living in this, in this industry, especially guys that never even thought of being a coach. They just said, you know what, I'm going to take your course and see if I can become a coach. I know people making really, really good money. So, you know, once again, it's worth you leaving your comfort zone and spending a few bucks. It's a one-day course. Come on, who doesn't have one day to blow? I, you, you waste so much money on stupid things in life, uh, on performance enhancing drugs, on GH. Just lay off the GH for a month and come take the course. Believe me, it'll be worth the money that you spend. Uh, the next course, believe it or not, is Saturday, June 29th here in Cape Coral. It's filling up fast, so go to DavePaloma.com uh, and you can sign up over there. Let's go to Hap Holly Fit. In your personal experience, was it healthier and more beneficial to blast and cruise in the off-season rather than PCT? and come off completely. Some bodybuilding gurus have explained the unhealthy side of PCT and recommended blasting, then cruising test at 250 mg a week. Your thoughts? I hate the terms blast and cruise. I, it, it, it just drives me nuts, I gotta be honest with you. I, I hate when people make up these slang terms for like, you know, for things that it make it sound cool. The bottom line is that when you're done with your cycle, you know, after a show, or if you're, if you're not competing that year, let's say you've done 
your 24, 30 weeks of being on a cycle, okay? Get off, clean out, do your PCT, okay? Which you don't necessarily have to do PCT if you don't want. I would do it if I were you, just, just to kind of help turn your body back on a little bit. But the bottom line is being, and I've said this before, being off cycle, having low testosterone levels is actually good for recovery. Because what happens is the receptors, they see nothing. They're, there's no testosterone. They're like, what the hell is going on? So the, rece the androgen receptors think there's not enough re receptors, so it increases the androgen receptor density, which means it produces more receptors on the nucleus of the, of the muscle cell membrane. Looking for the testosterone molecules, because the, the body thinks it doesn't have enough receptors. Now, after you know, eight weeks or six weeks, whatever you've been off, whatever your off cycle is, you go back on a cycle again, you have all this new receptors that are just waiting to find some steroid molecules that will bind to them, and because you have this, this exuberant, or this, this, this much larger density of, of receptors now, you're gonna respond very well. If you stay on a low dose all the time, your down-regulated receptors will stay down-regulated, and when you go back on cycle again, you're not gonna see a, a big surge in muscle gains. It's just not gonna happen. Um, that's from a, a mechanistic and results standpoint. From a toxicity issue, you want to get off the stuff also so that your body can just clean out. Your liver is, is sick of constantly breaking shit down. Give it a break, you know. Let it get rid of all the junk that's in your body, you know, for six to eight weeks. And this way, it's ready to go when you, when you hit it hard again, you know, and you add all that food back in and you start, you know, demanding that it put muscle on or burn body fat or whatever the, the case may be. You always have to give your body a break. Otherwise, your body breaks. You're watching Ask Dave on RxMuscle.com. Before we go to the next question, Dave, you have a very, very special guest in studio right now. Why don't you introduce this very, very, and I stress very special guest. We have on, have on the channel before, but we are pleased, as always, to have her on again. Denise Asino, what's up? <laughs> she stopped by and say hello to Amanda and I. She's in town from California, and uh, you have your house in Fort yes, Myers. Yes. Is there a rumor that you might be uh, moving here back? I, this is home to me. Yeah. This is always home to me. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's always good to be back here. You know, my family's here. Everybody's here. Uh -huh. You're here. Right. Aria's here. Yeah. Oh, you came to no, see the kids. Here. Yeah. You'll see yeah, the kids. Yeah, They'll yeah. be here soon. I'm not really here to see you. I know you're not here. You know that, right? <laughs> I think I actually heard that she's here to see the fruit trees on our property. I'm here right? to see the fruit trees. I love them. Yeah, yeah. So, so I right, tell everyone what you've been doing because everyone's you know. You've been out of the scene. When was the last time you competed? Oh my God, the last time I competed was 07. Okay, so that's like, yeah, you're a few years after me, so. A couple years ago. So that's like 12 like years. Like that, the time goes like 12 this. years, wow. 12 years. You're still in great shape though. I, yeah, I'm not Whoa. gonna stop working out just because I'm not getting on stage. Uh -huh. All the world is a stage, you ever hear that? Of course, and you've done, you've done a documentary since then. The documentary. I love yeah, it. And, um, Where can people see that documentary, by the way? Uh, it's on iTunes. Mm -hmm. and uh, tell everyone on, what the, what the name of it is. It's on Amazon. You can find it on adventuresofmisfit.com. Yeah, we talked about that in a, in a previous episode. But that I, I love that. And then you also, uh, what else did you do recently? Um, I'm still, you know, I still have my websites. I yeah. still have denisepacino.com Denise and musclepinups.com. Mm -hmm. Still promoting. You were at the Arnold. Yes. Talk about that. Because um, that's the one show you kind of go to every year still. That's the, yeah, that's the show where I get to see the people that I've uh, met 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Because you're kind of like, at, you don't, you kind of really don't follow the sport, but then you go to the Arnold and you're thrust back into that environment. You have like a great booth location right by the stage there. Right. It's so, the same spot every single year. Do you say, did you dread going there or are you like, oh, this is cool? No, I love it All because right. I get to see people that I feel like I've grown up with mm -hmm. in the sport. And that is, that's everybody. Right. That's the people that are, you know, that are in charge of the sport, mm -hmm. the promoters, mm -hmm. uh, the people that have the, the supplement companies, sure. and then the fans uh, the, that have been following mm -hmm. the sport, the mm -hmm. hardcore fans that have been spot following the, the sport from even way before mm -hmm. I started, you know, who watched the sure, trajectory sure. of my career. And, um, and I love it. Uh, I, was very, I was very nostalgic this year. Really? Why do you think that is? Because people were bringing me old pictures. They do that from, to me too. I love it because I have no pictures of myself. I'm like, holy mackerel, this yeah. was from like 20 years ago. Uh, I took this picture with you and I was like, you know, wearing one of those cutoff shirts and I had like, you know, I had the arm pose up and, and I'm like, holy mackerel. Yes. I, I, yeah, and I, and uh, I mean, I, 
there are there are people uh, who brought me pictures of me holding their six month old. And now the kids now in college. The kids, now the guys <laughs> college. Go to college, and so I haven't changed at all. Right, you know, right, right. they have. They've sure. grown. Sure. Um, so I was feeling very, very, very nostalgic yeah. this year, and the the show has changed a lot. Um, I feel like it it started to age the, as far as the population, but mm. now there's so much fresh blood. Mm. You know, there's so much in the world of lifting mm -hmm. with the cross fit competitions and sure. the strong men, strong women competitions and the weightlifting competitions and the number of women that are participating mm. have has exceeded the number of men participating. Absolutely. And um so that's a huge change from right. when I started. I mean Would you ever want to get back on stage and, and do like a women's physique show? No. I, I live vicariously through the women <laughs> that are competing now and I, I You don't miss it. you don't miss it when you when you watch them up on stage. I you know, I do miss it mm -hmm. because bodybuilding is an art form for me. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a creative a form of creative expression, mm -hmm. which is what most sports yeah, are. Yeah, sure. And um, so now what I do is, is I coach women who are getting ready uh, okay. for their first shows and are going to compete. And I teach them posing and stage they need Believe me, they need that. You should yeah. see some of these people don't know what they're doing on stage. And right. you know what? A lot of the people are starting out so fresh that they've been working out for six months. They don't know what to do. So it's good. I was just talking about coaching people to get them ready for a competition from diet wise, presentation is super important too. Yes, it is. And I think, uh, I know in bodybuilding, it's, you work so hard and mm. there's so much work involved the, with the diet and the meal prep and the training and the cardio and mm. that people put the posing and the presentation kind of on the back burner. Which is a big mistake, obviously. Huge mistake yeah. because what you're doing is uh, you have to find a way to accentuate the best part of mm. your body of and how course. to present yourself the best way, how to de-emphasize mm. the areas that are not your strong points. Tired. And obviously in bodybuilding, you're trying to create this perfect symmetrical package, yeah. but you know, you pick those out, right. you know, in the crowd. And so emphasizing the things that really serve you and learning what that is. And then mm. also um, having a good time because it's, you're so stressed out. I mean, your body's stressed out. You realize that now. No, you know what you realize now because we realize now that the best time was getting ready for these shows and we were so miserable getting ready for them we didn't really enjoy it as much as we probably right, should have, you right. know. Because it's such a And it goes fast. Work. It's done like that. Right, exactly. Right. So your time on stage is so quick. And so part of what I teach is up here. It's mentality. It's yeah. perspective. It's... Um, Understanding that the sport, it's not like a race and a finish line. Mm. There's no baskets to shoot. Sure. It's not that cut and dry. It's a presentation. Mm -hmm. And you got to, you have to draw the crowd in. Well, you were always very good at that. Thank that you. That was one of your strongest. You got to draw the judges in. You got to make them look at you. You have to sure. separate yourself from the crowd, which mm. is hard to do when there's a lot of people on of stage. And um, so you got to make a connection, and that's part of what I teach. I teach how important. to connect, Very how to important. have a good time, how to draw people in, mm. and to remember that um, you know you got a group of judges who have very specific. You know, right, interest. Right. You're not being judged by the the internet community. There, you have live people st two, f ten feet away from you who are right, judging you. Right. But my thing is, is win the crowd. Oh, of course, because that, that influences the judges, I think. Absolutely, it yeah. influences the judges. And the, the, the I always thought that the people who have the most people in the audience cheering for them, it, it, it makes the judges say, oh, 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 this guy must be better than he really is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the thing is, is that 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people have more influence collectively than mm. 10, 12 sure. judges. At the end of the day, now you, if you're focused just on the trophy, right, mm. then you may not see that. Yeah. But my whole career, I learned early on, I wasn't going to out-muscle anybody. Right, right. I wasn't going to out-shred anybody. I'm petite. Mm. I'm a good bodybuilder. Mm. I made it to the Olympia. I did all the things I mm. wanted to do. But what I did was I focused on the masses. I focused mm. on the audience. And those are the people who supported me. Win the crowd, they said, like in Gladiator. Win the crowd. <laughs> yeah. And that's my favorite movie line. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you win your crowd, you win the freedom. And, and that's where the real magic mm. happens. You know? Now, last question. Arnold, did you see he got kicked in his in the back in South Africa? I saw that. I saw his response What's, to it. Yeah, he was pretty cool about it, right? Yeah, well, but Arnold has a 
really? He's like John really? Wayne, isn't he? Right. Like, he was just like, he's so tough, he didn't even let, this guy, he's like, oh, I thought someone bumped me from behind. The guy like drop kicked him, you know, from behind. Right. I mean, he it was crazy. I, thought, I always get jostled, which he does. Of course. You know, he's got, I always, they have to, it's like the parting of the Red yeah, Sea yeah. when he goes But now you know why? Because there's cuckoo play, cuckoo people out there. People are, yeah, people but are he was cool about it. attention. What I saw his his response was, um, I'm just glad the idiot didn't, you know, mess up my Snapchat. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Arnold, like, Arnold is so single-mindedly focused. He didn't even right, let it. He didn't even miss it. He didn't miss this a beat. He kind of stumbled a little and he caught himself. And <laughs> don't mess with my game. I hope I'm that agile at 71 years old, right? Yeah. Well, great I'm seeing so you good. again, and uh, you always it's always good. a pleasure to come by. And it, thanks for joining us on the set of. Uh, Ask Dave. Stay pumped. <laughs> All right. Back to you, Sid. All right. Great seeing Denise, as always, especially in studio. Let's proceed with the questions. We'll take four more. The Ship Dog. Dave, I've heard that a keto diet is effective in fighting cancer, as cancer cells are extremely insulin sensitive and can't use ketones as a fuel source. Is this true in your opinion? Yeah, you know, um, Cancer cells are, are very uh, glycolytic cells. They like to use glucose as a fuel source. That's, that's what feeds them. If you starve them of their full fuel source, they don't grow very effectively. Eating tons of sugar while you have cancer is like, you know, it's like feeding the bugs. You know, here you go, take fuel. It's like feeding all the bugs. Of course, you can get more bugs in your house, right? So you want to starve them out. You want to starve those cancer cells. Eating a lower carb ketogenic diet, obviously, where your body is using a lot of ketones as fuel, which are basically fats is gonna make the, the cancer cells you know, not have anything to, to help them divide. Likewise, super oxygenating your body also will kill off cancer cells because they don't do well. They, they're, they're cells that operate in an, anaerobic rest, uh, in an anaerobic environment, which means without oxygen. So we put more oxygen in there by exercising. Some people do ozone treatments, oxygen treatments. We starve them by not giving them sugar. We, we only eat, you know, a ketogenic diet would be ideal, but if you can't do that, stick to complex carbs that don't cause huge surges in, in blood sugar, and you know, the, the, and keep your immune system healthy, and try to sleep, you know, try to you know be rested. And and I think that you know there's been tremendous. Uh, I know Quest uh, Protein, uh, the the bar company, had done a lot of research with dogs with cancer, giving them ketogenic diets, and you know the medical ketogenic diet is higher fat, a little lower protein, because remember. Bodybuilders require more protein. So my ketogenic diet is higher in protein, moderate fats. The medical ketogenic diet that they give to cancer people, higher fats, moderate protein. Now, if you're a cancer patient that happens to be a bodybuilder too, you're gonna wanna eat higher protein and, and, and you know more moderate fats. But the key is keep the carbs really low. Let's go to Pat, Pat 55. Interesting one here. Similar to how mo uh, more NFL players are retiring young with the increase in CTE awareness, do you forecast a similar effect with bodybuilders as health concerns become more apparent? This, here's, the, the, here's my, my take on what the future of, of bodybuilding is going to look like in terms of health you know, things. I, I think that they, guys are taking more risks today and doing stupid things with you know, drug dosing. But I also think there's more medical awareness nowadays. You know, there's people like myself, not just me, but other people out there putting awareness out there. Get your blood work done. Check your blood pressure. Let's keep eye on your blood sugars. If they're too high, let's, let's address that. You know, let's go for your cardiac CT scans to see how your coronary arteries are doing. So I think that the people that are, are out there who know they're pushing the envelope are getting more diagnostic tests done to see if there's anything wrong with them so that this might be a, a better way of controlling future problems. Whereas when I was just starting out, everyone's head was in the sand, myself included. I didn't want to know. I, we didn't know. There was no blood sugar monitors to test. You know, only diabetics had those things. You know, we didn't test blood pressure because there was no automatic cuffs back then. You had to have a vest at the scope, and it was a pain in the neck. And so we just didn't care about it. And that's that's stupid. Okay, that's a stupid. I, that's the one thing I regret that I didn't do more health testing. I did some, but not enough. Luckily, I didn't. I always had very good body awareness, and I never had high cholesterol levels, so I didn't. I don't have heart disease now. But. You know, that was just lucky, you know. If we would have known back then what we know today, I think we would have been more on top of it. So, yeah, there's going to be more chance of, of future problems because of the dosages people are doing today. But, once again, we're doing more diagnostic testing. People like myself are getting the word out that it's important to know your values on your blood work. It's important to know your blood pressure, your blood sugars, and to see the heart of your health. Uh, the, the, yeah, the health of your heart, excuse me. And that 
hopefully will lower the incidence of problems in the future. Esteban86, Dave, do you recommend reducing protein per meal in half during peak week for a classic physique competitor to make weight and keep the waist small? Making weight, there's a lot of different strategies to it, from dehydrating to, um, if the person is, is, is absolutely shredded, I probably wouldn't lower food too much because that, then you risk flattening them out too much. And once you, a person gets too, too flat, it's very, very hard to fill them out again. So what I would rather do is dehydrate them. Now, it depends when the weigh-in is. Is the weigh-in two days before? Is it one day before? Is it the morning of the show? That's when the strategy comes. And if it's the morning of the show, I carb them up as, as normal. I don't restrict that. I, I, I fill them up and then what I do is, you know, I dehydrate them and I don't let them drink anything or eat anything until they make that weight in that morning. If they gotta go sit in a sauna, if I gotta give them a little bit more diuretic, I do it. Um, if you can't get them down to weight the morning of the show, then they shouldn't be doing that weight class or they shouldn't be doing that division, you know? I have guys in classic that just can't make it, you know? I'm not gonna ruin their physique, I just put them in bodybuilding, that's all. At least you have an option, you know, to go to. Likewise, you know, if you can't make a bodybuilding weight class, you know, because then you do the heavier class, that's all. I mean, the, the, the problem with classic is if you don't make your weight, you, you can't do classic because you have to be a certain weight for a certain height. So that, that's a problem. Now, if you have the day, if you got the day before, two days before to make the weight, you could pretty much lose a lot of weight and still do it. And I usually do that with water restriction. Um, if it's on a Thursday for a Saturday show, it's easy because I don't carve them up until they make the weight and then I carve them for the next two days. If it's on a Friday, I'll carve them on Thursday and I won't give them anything Friday until they make weight. So there's different strategies obviously for different weigh-in times. Before we go to the next question, Dave, last night you put out a video uh, reviewing a mattress that you had received called the Spine Align. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions if you wanna address that a little bit. Yeah, you know, I, I don't like to do like, you know, advertising for companies unless I really believe in the product. Now, Spine Align had sent me a pillow a couple, like about six months, maybe eight months ago and said, here, I want you to try it. And I told him, I said, I'm, I'm not gonna recommend it if I don't like it. It's a chiropractic pillow, it kind of puts your head in the right anatomic position. It you know, lifts your head up a little bit so you're not laying flat. And it puts your, and, and I found that I got a good night's sleep on it. And it, it took me a couple days to get used to it, but I found that I wasn't waking up with headaches. I was, my neck didn't need to be adjusted as much as the chiropractor. And so I started recommending it to people and a lot of people bought it. I have a link at DavePaloma.com, you can, you can see the spinal line pillow. It, it's, most, it's funny how people have so many, you know, shoe, they have orthotics for their shoes, they use special sneakers, and no one thinks about how they sleep at night. You're spending half your life in, in a bed, you know? Most people do not, they either use too many pillows, they don't use enough pillows, their head's not in the right position. I have a big head, so I need my head positioned properly. And I, I'm telling you, you get one of these chiropractic pillows, you will be so happy, you, you'll thank me. So I did this thing and they said, look, we have a new mattress that it's, it's a high end mattress. It's like five levels of foam. It's got the, um, the, the coils buried in the, in the mammary foam deep down. So you're not going to feel coils in your back. And as a bodybuilder, you, you're going to really appreciate it. I said, well, you know, I'm not recommending it if I don't try it. I said, if you want to send me one, I'll, I'll sleep in it for you know, a few weeks and I'll tell you what I think about it. So they sent me this mattress. It, it sat in, in, a, in, a, in a, all wrapped up for probably a month because I just been, haven't had time. And I, un I undid it. I, it's pretty cool. When you take the vacuum sealer off, it kind of just blows up. You can watch the, uh, the video. It's pretty cool. And I slept in it for like a week. And I'm like, holy mackerel. This is the, the best mattress I've ever slept in. But one of the great things about this mattress is that it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. You, to get a mattress like this, you probably have to spend three, $4,000. This mattress is under two thousand. It's like seventeen hundred dollars or something. Like that. It's it's so worth it, you know. For th those of you out there who ha don't live in your own house and you haven't bought a mattress yet, you don't even know what I'm talking about. But anyone who's gone out there, mattresses are expensive, and you never wind up getting a, the, a high quality mattress because you don't want to spend the money. This is a high quality mattress for an affordable price. I said, you know what? I feel comfortable promoting this thing. Um, I don't. I'm not getting paid by them anything. I got a free mattress out of it, but that that's it. And I wouldn't have. I told them. I said if I didn't like the mattress, I would not promote it. So I'm I'm just putting it out there for you guys because I know once again sleep is important. This thing is very comfortable. Um, I bought the medium. They have different firmness. They have medium. They have soft. They have hard. My wife likes soft, but I I usually like the hard. But I'm not as big as I used to be. So we compromised on the medium, and it's perfect. It's got like a mattress pad on top. It's so comfortable. Um, I, I, I tell you the truth, I haven't gotten as good a night's sleep 
in a long time. It, I stay asleep better. I don't wake up with pains. I don't have to keep turning from side to side to find a comfortable position. It's up to you guys. There's a link in the description with a, if you use my Dave at, uh, 5 code, you get 5% off. It's, uh, it, it's, I, I'm very impressed with it. Take a couple more questions. Lost in Quarian, Dave, hate the show. What leg routine would you recommend to someone who's had an ACL reconstruction surgery and several tears in a meniscus? You know, everyone's uh, injuries to their knees and to their legs are different. If, if you can squat and you're not in pain, then squat. If, if, if the meniscal tear makes it such that you can't and that you need more support, then you might want to try squatting on a Smith machine. If that bothers you, you might want to hack squat, you know. Uh, or even, you know, I don't like the 45 degree leg press. I don't really think, I, I never felt like a good development out of it, but I like the straight on leg press, you know. I think that that hits quads a little bit more. You have to kind of cater your injury, you know, training to your injury. But if you can squat, I always found that with a wide stance, feet, toes pointed forward squat, where you're leaning on your heels and pushing off your heels, if you open your stance up, it takes the pressure off the knees. I think people squat too close, and when you squat too close, your knees are in a weird, torqued position, and that puts a lot of strain on them. As you open your stance up, and you open your legs when you squat, you're going to find that your knees are not really being taxed, and they're not bothering you while you're squatting. Try that. I, I promise you, you'll probably have no problems with it. We'll take one more question from Kyle Marinucci. Dave, your worst post-show rebound experience? First show I ever did. 100% natural. Did Uva Ursi diuretics. I weighed in at 168 pounds. After the show was over, I gained 40 pounds in two days. I, I, was, I looked huge, but I was in the gym squatting. I had to sit down between sets. My back was killing me. I thought I was in kidney failure, so I was afraid to do any more of the herbal diuretics. I said, holy mackerel, I know I gained 40 pounds, but... I can't take, I'll be dead, right? I, I, I figured I was, I didn't know anything. I thought I was gonna destroy my kidney. So I went to the emergency room. I was in medical school at the time. I went to the emergency room uh, at the hospital where I were at school and they ran every test. They said, you're completely normal. There's nothing wrong with you. And the doctor came in and he's like, I was in Vietnam. We didn't drink for two days straight. We came back, we had a case of beer each and we're still alive today to talk about it. You'll be fine. I said, are my kidneys okay? That's all I'm asking you. He's like, they're fine. So I went back and I started taking some herbal diuretics and within a day I started feeling better. I lost 25 pounds. So what I found was after the, after the shows from now on, if you're gonna eat, you probably should stay on a little diuretic, whether it be the, an herbal, if that's what you're using, or a little diazide. Don't let your body weight go over 10 or 15 pounds because once you get to that point, you're going to feel really uncomfortable. And once, if you stay on a little diuretic after about a week, you should be fine. Your body will regulate itself. It's just that your body is, is, is responding to the water restriction and to the sodium restriction by hyper-absorbing sodium in water. So you got to kind of force your body to get rid of that water until everything equilibrates itself. That's going to do it for this episode of Ask Dave again, brought to you by Species Nutrition, Cuts Training and Fitness, and Liquid Sunray. Special thanks to Dave Palumbo, Denise Messino joining us live in studio, and of course, our producer, Tyler Shore. I'm Sadiq Farouk, reminding you right now at rxmuscle.com, we have the interview with Keon Pearson, as well as yesterday's episode of Iron Debate. See you next week.